Good afternoon. We're just going to give it a couple more seconds just to get the last minute attendees logged in and then we'll go ahead and start the presentation. All right, well, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. Uh, today we are hosting uh, Data Logger Basics, the fundamentals of water monitoring, which essentially we're gonna be covering a high level overview of uh, different uh, techniques that we have for uh, water quality and uh, water level monitoring, uh, as well as some best practices. And we'll go over some uh, equipment and uh, some new equipment that we are have released and will be coming out with. So I am your presenter today. My name is Shannon Ryerson. I am a senior sales representative here at Onset. I've been with the company for over five years and I specialize in assisting researchers, consultants, uh, government agencies and universities in a wide range of environmental monitoring applications. Just a few housekeeping notes uh, on the webinar today. This webinar will run for approximately 45 minutes We'll save five minutes towards the end to answer questions uh, that you may have. Uh, please feel free to type your questions into the question section of the control panel. And also this webinar is being recorded and we will send a link uh, following this recording uh, if you want to view it at a later date and this will be included in an email. So just a little bit about Onset. We are the makers of the Hobo Data Loggers. We are located in Massachusetts on beautiful Cape Cod. Onset's sole focus is on accurate and reliable data, logger, uh, data logging and monitoring. We are a world leader in data loggers with a global network of dist uh, distributors. Onset is ISO 9001-2015 certified, and we were founded in 1981. So for our agenda today, uh, we will start off with a sneak peek of a uh, new logger that we're coming out with that I think uh, a lot of our current Hobo users will be very excited about. And then we'll touch base on what is a data logger, how to use a data logger, how to select a data logger, measurements and applications, how to collect your data, deployment tips, and we'll follow it up with some use cases and application stories. And as we mentioned, at the end, we will save some time for Q&A. So without further ado, I would just like to touch base that we are coming out with a uh, CTD data logger, which essentially will uh, be have built in Bluetooth for fast and easy wireless data offload. This will be our MX100 series, and it will provide a single integrated platform for monitoring a range of critical water parameters. With uh, the MX800, we will have uh, two models for it. Uh, they will be easy to deploy, fully submersible, which will be the 801, or a direct read, which will be the 802, with an integrated barometric pressure, which will allow you to uh, fastly offload your data to our Hobo Connect app. Uh, there will also be a water detect feature on the 801 that will indicate on your data file when the logger was out of, water, uh, out of the water. And one nice uh, feature about this product is that it will have interchangeable sensors. So you can swap out sensors for different applications. Uh, it allows you to connect two sensors to one logger to get measurements like salinity adjusted dissolve oxygen directly. So no need for doing post-processing. Uh, we offer guided calibration to ensure highly accurate data. And the logger itself will be less than two inches in diameter, which essentially means it will fit down uh, most stilling wells. Uh, we will have some more information regarding this data logger in the future, so keep an eye on your inbox. You will be seeing some information on this coming up soon. So before we get into the presentation, we always like to start out with a poll question just to gauge uh, who's in our attendance. So with this one, uh, our poll question is, are you currently using data loggers?
Excellent. So it looks like we got a pretty good ma uh, mix in the crowd today. I'm happy to see that 80% of you are currently using data loggers. Uh, so some of this may be a, a repeat of information that you already know, uh, but there will be some new products that we will be discussing. So hopefully you'll be able to take something away from it. And the rest of the 20%, I think you'll find this presentation very helpful on selecting and deploying data loggers for your upcoming projects. So what is a data, like, a data logger? A data logger is essentially an electronic instrument that records measurements at a set interval over a period of time. Uh, typically data loggers are a compact battery powered device equipped with internal microprocessor, data storage, and one or more sensors. Data loggers can be de deployed indoors, outdoors, and underwater. And data loggers can record data for up to years at a time unattended which essentially means that they are uh, low maintenance uh, devices. So how to use a data logger? Uh, step one would be to download and install your software on a mobile device or computer. After that, you would connect the data logger and launch the parameters. Then you'd place the data logger in the desired location and record that data for a set period of time. Once you're done with the deployment, you essentially reconnect the data logger to your mobile device or laptop. And then you download and read out the data file with analysis software. So here are some common uh, questions to think about when you are choosing a data logger. First one is, what do I need to measure? Where do I need to take this measurement? And how long do I need to record for? Also, is this a one-time situation or is this part of an ongoing project or something you'd like to keep in your toolkit for troubleshooting? Also, how often will I need to access this data and how would I like to access it? Some additional considerations uh, would be measurement accuracy, data access options, software capabilities, life of the battery, cost of ownership, and also product support. So for this presentation, again, we're gonna be uh, focusing mostly on our underwater data loggers. So some underwater measurements that you can record and capture with our data loggers are water temperature, water level, conductivity, salinity, water flow, pH, and light intensity. Some other options uh, you can use to record uh, with our data loggers are four to 20 milliamp signals, pulse signals, and DC voltage signals. Now this can, be, this, uh, can prove beneficial with our data loggers. Uh, for example, if you have a third party sensor uh, that you like to record data with that has uh, an analog output, again, such as a four to 20 milliamp pulse or DC voltage signal, you can connect it to our, one of our data loggers with the appropriate input adapter cable. And then you just set up the linear scaling of the min and max reading of that sensor versus the min and max uh, analog signal output. And then our uh, data loggers and software will do that scaling for you. So how to collect your data from uh, our data loggers? And we essentially have three different options. Our first option is optical communication. And essentially it uses fiber optic technology to transmit data from the data logger to a laptop running our HoboWare or HoboWare Pro software. We also have Bluetooth data loggers where you essentially download a free app to a mobile device. And as long as you're within a hundred feet line of sight range from these data, uh, from the Bluetooth data loggers, you'll be able to connect to them to do your configuration and data offload. And these two options are essentially what we consider as our standalone devices. We also have web-based remote monitoring stations, which communicate uh, to our cloud-based platform over a cellular, Wi-Fi, or ethernet connection, which essentially gives you remote access to this data, as well as the ability to receive remote alarm notifications. With our standalone data loggers, uh, this essentially gives you uh, manual data access either over uh, USB, uh, fiber optic, or optical communication device, and Bluetooth. These are highly accurate devices. They're easy to deploy. They're extremely durable. And one of the biggest features is that they are cost-effective solutions. 
And these could prove beneficial if, um, especially if you know, you're know you on a budget and you need to have multiple data loggers uh, deployed over a large area to give you a better data profile um, you know, of the estuary, you know, stream, river, or whatever you're trying to monitor. Again, this gives you a great cost-effective solution for being able to record multiple data points uh, in a given area. So our HoboWare Pro software is what you would use with our optical uh, devices as well as USB. And uh, the, the software is essentially what you would use to configure the logger and read it out. And configuring the logger essentially is setting how long you want it to record for, how often you want it to take a measurement, if you want to set any alarm parameters, um, and also if you want to do a set start and stop time. This also provides scaling to real-world engineering users, uh, units. Uh, out of HoboWare uh, Pro, you do get presentation quality graphs. And these data files are easily exported uh, to text or Excel format, so essentially a CSV or an XLS file. And we also include time-saving tools for fast setup and data offload. And it also provides ad advanced plotting tools for more pre precise data analysis. Um, and essentially what that means is you can apply filters to your data. So if you want to look at, you know, um, highs and lows or averages or, you know, even statistical, uh, statist statistical data such as the min, max, standard deviation, our software gives you the ability to do that. So just to continue on with using our uh, HoboWare Pro software with some of our standalone optical and USB data loggers, uh, we have simple menus for fast, easy logger setup and re readout. And it looks like, actually, I think we already presented some of this on here. Yep, and I guess there's one other thing to touch on here is that we do have advanced plotting tools for more precise data analysis and access to data assistance for post-processing data. So some of our data assistance that we offer, um, a great example would be uh, our water level data loggers. Those are low maintenance devices because there is just a single pressure transducer in it. But in order to uh, derive water level from our water level data loggers, you do need to record barometric pressure. And then essentially what you would do is include uh, both the barometric pressure data file and the data file from the water level logger that was in the water, and it will do its offset and automatically do that barometric uh, compensation for you. So no need to post process that on your own. Uh, this also comes into play with our uh, conductivity and salinity data loggers um, that helps you uh, 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 ensure that you're getting the most accurate data from those loggers. Uh, you know, by setting a starting calibration point and an end, uh, end calibration point, and then that will help offset the data just to ensure, um, you know, if there was any drift during its uh, deployment, that it corrects for that drift. So with our Bluetooth data loggers, uh, we have a free app called Hobo Connect that you would use to uh, work with those loggers. Uh, within the Hobo Connect, it uh, easily allows you to locate and view all the loggers that are within range. Um, again, it's a 100 feet line of sight range to be able to connect to our Bluetooth data loggers. And you don't need to pair your device uh, with our data logger. Essentially, our Bluetooth data loggers uh, are constantly broadcasting their Bluetooth signal. So when you're in range uh, within the app, you'll see a populate rate on the app. And then you, you simply just tap on the data logger or device that you want to connect to. Uh, once you select the device you want to connect to, uh, it allows you to configure your logger, very similar to what you would do in our HoboWare Pro software. So you can set the logging interval, i.e. how often you want to uh, want it to take a reading, and then also program alarm notifications. You can also add password protect. So again, these are always broadcasting, but if you don't want uh, other uh, clients or other um, coworkers accessing your data or even just general public accessing your data, you can set a password on it where when they tap on that logger to connect to it, they would need to know what that password is to actually gain access to the logger. And then finally, you can set uh, start and stop times on this device. Um, 
I, I find that beneficial if, you know, essentially you're programming a bunch of loggers for a project and you want them to, you know, all collect data at the same time and stop at the same time. Uh, you know, you can program all the data loggers to say start at noon time on Monday and then stop logging at 5 p.m. on Friday. That way, if you're trying to analyze multiple data loggers on a single file or on a single graph, uh, it makes it much easier to line up uh, all the data log all the data loggers files on that one graph. For our uh, water level data loggers, you also have the um, the ability to enter water parameters. So essentially with our water level data loggers, you would need to take a reference water level reading and let it know, you know, when the data logger is in this water, you know, down this stilling well, this depth is what it's experiencing for pressure right now. And then that's what it'll use to um, essentially calibrate itself to any uh, change or deviation in that water level. And then you also have the ability to uh, adjust for um, uh, the different types of water density. So fresh water, salt water, brackish water, things like that. Or even if you uh, know what the pollen port per uh, feet cubed is of uh, the water you're deploying in, we do give you the, the, the ability to uh, manually input that data. And then through the app, you can quickly and easily download and view the data within seconds. With most of our data loggers, even if the memory is full on them, you're only looking at 30 seconds or less to download uh, all that data. Most of the time, it's a matter of a couple seconds. Uh, one nice feature about the Hobo Connect app is that you can view that data right on your mobile device once you offload it in a line graph form. Um, but then you also have the ability to export and share that data. So once it's offloaded to the device, uh, you choose a file that you want to share, and it's going to ask you how you want to export it. You can choose uh, either an XLS, a CSV, a Hobo file, if you like to use our Hoboware software with, uh, to do your data analysis, and also a PNG file. Um, essentially, the PNG file is going to uh, deliver a for lack of a better term, a picture of the uh, graphical readout that you see on the right-hand side of your screen. Lastly, we do have our web-based uh, remote monitoring stations. Um, and one in particular that we have for water level water quality monitoring is our uh, MicroRx RX2100 uh, series stations. These are small, compact, versatile, low cost stations that communicate to our HoboLink uh, cloud-based platform uh, through a cellular connection. Uh, these are intended for outdoor monitoring applications and they do have a built-in 1.7 watt solar panel. The MicroRx water level station does come with a built-in uh, barometric pressure sensor and a water level and flow uh, sensor. So essentially the station is going to do that barometric pressure compensation for you at the station and you don't have to worry about doing that post-processing. Uh, the next step up for that would be our flagship RX3000 remote monitoring station. This is a robust, flexible, rugged uh, station with cellular communication options to deliver its uh, data to our cloud-based platform, Hobolink. I always like to uh, say that this station is more of a modular device. Um, and I usually lean towards this station if you're going to be using this on multiple products or it's not like a permanent in installment. One reason being is that inside the RX3000, there's two module uh, ports that allow you to integrate um, all of the uh, uh, RX modules that we have available for it. So we have an RX water level module, our uh, wireless sensor manager. We also have an analog module that would allow you to connect third-party sensors that output an analog signal, and it also provides excitation power to those sensors. And then we have a relay module as well that you can connect to it. Uh, the analog module, it does have four channels on it, so you can connect up to four sensors that will put, uh, you know, a 4 to 20 milliamp or DC voltage signal. And again, it does reply, uh, um, 
it does uh, supply excitation power to those sensors. So no need, no need to worry about powering those off for separate power supply. All of our stations, uh, I should say all of our RX stations, regardless if it's uh, the 2100 series or the 3000 series, allows you to connect up to 50 of our wireless sensors. Uh, each of those wireless sensors do have a range of about 1,500 feet to 2,000 feet line of sight, and they also uh, form what we call a self-healing mesh network. So if for some reason a sensor is out of range from the RX station, uh, it can actually pass its signal through other sensors in line, making up to five hops to get that signal back to the RX station. And this is another product that I'm excited and happy to uh, introduce to you if, you if our attendees weren't all already aware of it. But uh, just towards the end of last year, we have finally released a true HoboNet water level uh, sensor. So it is a wireless sensor that uh, wirelessly transmit, it transmits water level data back to our RX stations. Um, just like our standard water level data loggers, this is a non-vented design, so it reduces maintenance. Again, no need to be cleaning all vent tubes or worry about those getting clogging or anything like that. Um, they are durable ceramic sensors, so they can withstand freezing. Uh, just like our U20 data loggers, these do come with a three-point NIST traceable calibration certificate. Um, and one of the nice features about this is that this provides real-time insights via customized dashboards to uh, Hobolink, leaving delays in your uh, getting your data in the past. Also, there's no data loss due to user error with uh, temperature compensated pressure readings for accurate, reliable information and uh, Hobolink cloud dashboards for an in-depth data analysis and smarter uh, decision makings. Uh, I see this proving very beneficial for people who are monitoring estuaries or um, maybe wetland mitigation, things like that. This allows you to take multiple readings over a large area and have all that data sent back to one localized platform. Uh, the cables are uh, Kevlar reinforced and they do have a uh, integrated strain relief uh, mechanism in them. So with our uh, remote uh, monitoring stations, you do all of your configurations right within Hobolink, which again is our uh, cloud-based web application. So from there, it's very similar to what you would do with our standalone data loggers. Um, you, uh, it gives you the ability to set when, how, long, how often you want to take a reading, um, reference water level readings, um, things like that, and as well as the ability to set alarm notifications. So what you're seeing on the right, uh, the left-hand picture is setting a sensor uh, alarm on here. So with this particular one, uh, for this water level sensor, they want to receive an alarm via email if the water level goes above seven feet for two uh, log data points. Uh, right below that, you can see that is five minutes. So essentially after 10 minutes, if this water hasn't subsided below seven feet, it will send out that instantaneous notification via text or email, letting you know that there has been an excursion uh, on that sensor. Uh, and one nice thing about our alarm notifications is that you don't have to wait for the connection interval to uh, get those alarm. The alarms are sent out on the logging interval. And that proves beneficial where maybe, um, you know, you're trying to be conservative with how much cell data that you're using. So you're only having data sent up to the cloud, you know, once an hour or once every few hours, but you're logging data, you know, at five or 10 minute intervals and you want to be notified if there is an excursion you know, at that moment, you don't have to wait those one or two hours for the data to go to the cloud before you get that alarm. It's done right at that logging interval. And within Hobolink, not only do we have an overview section, which essentially shows you what the last readings were from the data logger, uh, you also have the ability to create dashboards. Um, so essentially any uh, device that you have sending data to Hobolink, you can apply those uh, data sets uh, to a, uh, a widget on the dashboard and Hobolink. 
So it allows you to clearly see the information that you need. And also you can easily share these dashboards with other, and it's simply share a link or embed this in a web page. Uh, within Hobo Link, we do have what we call a public URL for both uh, the overview section and our dashboard section. And you can essentially think of that as a read-only option for your Hobo Link account where other people can go in, they can view data, they can export data, but they can't make any changes to the settings on it. And one nice thing about Hobo Link is with it being cloud-based, you can view this on any device that you use uh, to gain access to the web. So computer, laptop, netbook, tablet, mobile device, things of that nature. And lastly, as I mentioned before, the alarms are instantaneously and you can have receive those uh, via text message, email, or for redundancy purposes, you can set it up where you receive both a text and email. And also it does give you the ability if the alarm does clear before you have a chance to take action, you can set it up where you essentially really, uh, receive an all clear alarm status. So some other features within Hobo uh, Link is that when you mon uh, when you monitor from water level and specifically with our stations, uh, you do have the ability to calculate water flow based off of water level, and that can be inflows or outflows as well as spillways. And how we achieve this is through integrated conversions. Um, so if you have like a weir, you know, a V notch, rectangular, trapezoidal, uh, or a flume. You have the ability to uh, choose what type of wear you have, what that notch angle is, and then from there, you will be able to derive water flow based off of the water level reading in that wear or flume. Um, you do also have the ability to set up stage discharge curves, uh, which again will give you flow rate based off of water level, and you have the ability to configure and view these conditions via the web. Also within Hobo Link, we do have what we call a map view. So essentially when you get a station and you have you know, a handful of sensors, uh, wireless sensors, you can go and drop those um, via Google Maps on your Hobo Link account. So you can see um, essentially uh, all your stations and sensors on one map. Uh, and when you click on the station, it will give you what the current readings are and, uh, of that station and the same with any sensor as well. And uh, one nice feature about this is if you're doing, um, you know, say you have uh, sensors spread all over a large area, it will actually show you the path that the sensor signal is using to get back to the RX station. Uh, so, you know, you could see all of your sensors going directly to station or if a sensor's out of line, you could see it hopping from one sensor to another sensor uh, back to the station as well. So uh, just some additional data uh, information on how data is being uh, transferred between station uh, from sensor to station. So for some uh, underwater applications, we do have the ability to uh, track water quality. Uh, this is uh, useful with wetland mitigations, aquatic ecology, uh, ocean sciences, uh, also flood warning, dam management, hydrology, surface water, and storm water. Um, I've been seeing a lot lately of people doing more uh, storm water runoff monitoring, uh, just because I know uh, back when I used to live in uh, the Boston area, one of the big things was the storm water runoff going into the harbor and then over uh, salinating the harbor, which can obviously have uh, adverse effects and the aquatic life that's in there. So some tips for underwater deployments. Um, as you can see from the picture off on the right hand side, we always recommend if at all possible, always protect your data logger. We do sell those protective casings. Um, it essentially is just PVC pipe with some caps on it and holes drilled into it. So if you have any extra PVC pipe laying around and you want to come up with your own housing, you can always do that and essentially just copy our design. Uh, but essentially, uh, when you're uh, deploying our water quality loggers, you want to ensure that you have uh, steady flow. You want to make sure that you're avoiding freezing water. Um, now, you can't always do that. 
Uh, so, you know, if you have like data, lo- uh, say water level loggers that are deployed or even any of our other water quality data loggers, uh, at least try to make sure that they are going to be deployed under the ice line. You certainly don't want them getting frozen in the ice because that could potentially uh, crack some of our polypropylene, uh, polypropylene housed data loggers. Um, they don't contain any conductive material, so you don't have to worry about getting erroneous data from it. Uh, and you do want to make sure that the sensor is facing vertical to avoid any bubbles collecting on it. Obviously, when you get bubbles on there, that can start to skew your data readings. And then lastly, we do sell our uh, PVC uh, U2X housing for $46 just to ensure some additional protection. This, these prove beneficial if you're deploying these, you know, say in a fast moving stream where you have a lot of debris going through it, such as rock, stones, things like that, that will protect it from hitting, the dam- uh, hitting and damaging the data logger. So some additional deployment tips for uh, mounting is, uh, people get very creative with this. I will say that off the bat. So uh, some common tips are mounting them on top of a rock, or you know a, a cement slab or a cinder block. Um, some advantages to this are is that it's less visible if you do it this way uh, because you know it's out of sight, so reduces the chance of vandalism. And then it's also out of the way of boat traffic if you're deploying these in areas where, um, you know, say in a harbor where there's boats going in and out. Um, however, you do want to make sure you want to be able to find them. So maybe using some type of a visual marker or a landmark, or even if you have like a a GPS enabled device, you can always put a pin on there on where this is. So when you go back out to the site, uh, you can easily uh, find them. If you're doing these in deeper water where you don't necessarily have the ability to secure it to like a cinder block or something, uh, we do have some other options. Um, The first one, which is very, very common, uh, with water level and water quality is uh, putting them down a stilling well. And a stilling well essentially is just a piece of PVC slotted pipe uh, that you can attach to a structure such as a bridge or a dock. You know, you put a well cap on it, get some Teflon coated stainless steel cabling, attach it to that well cap, and then uh, drop the data logger down uh, into the water from there. If you're doing this out in an open channel where you may not necessarily have access to uh, a structure, you can use uh, the tether mount, which essentially would be a buoy on top and anchor weight on the bottom. And then you connect the data logger uh, to a post or beam uh, between those. And then lastly, there's always the post mount option. Um, Again, if this is going to be in a heavy traffic area, you would definitely wanna make sure that you put a marker at the top of that post just to ensure a boat um, or a personal watercraft does not run it over. And again, the sensor should uh, be facing vertical and at least one inch uh, from any metal to avoid uh, sudden temperature changes. Um, and also, um, if needed, you can always tap to release uh, any bubbles that may build up on it. So if you do decide to go with the, the uh, stilling well option, we do sell two inch uh, well caps. Um, and if you don't have a two inch stilling well, you could always get a, um, an adapter, like an expander or reducer to attach our well caps to. One nice feature about our well caps, especially with our uh, water level sensors from the RX station, is that there is a tension release uh, relief uh, system built into it. So it helps from the cable getting too stretched out. Um, and also it gives you the ability, an easy uh, and simple way to uh, deploy the logger down that ceiling well without having to, you know, um, get any additional uh, cable or a thing like, or rope or something like that to uh, secure the sensor to. So from here, I'd like to touch base on a few use cases uh, of clients using our uh, water level uh, monitoring stations. Uh, This first one actually comes from the North Carolina area. So in North Carolina, the Department of Conservation and Recreation helps dam owners manage more than 100 dams throughout their region. Uh, Monitoring high water levels at dam sites is a critical responsibility for dam owners. 
Uh, and typically what they would have to do is send uh, staff out to each of these individual dams to phys physically observe and measure water levels. Obviously, this can get costly and is somewhat uh, inefficient, especially during uh, severe weather, you know, such as storms, hurricanes, things like that, where water levels have the potential to quickly rise across multiple locations. Also, uh, the inability to swiftly notify, uh, notify the nearby population of impending flooding could lead to severe co uh, consequences, uh, especially to those people who are living downstream from these dams. So what the Department of Conversation, uh, Conservation had done is actually implemented our Hobo Micro RX water level station, which again is a cellular web enabled water level monitoring solution. Uh, this compact co competitively uh, priced station uh, withstands deployments in harsh conditions and provides reliable monitoring. Uh, with the station, you have the ability to monitor water flow as well as accumulated rainfall calculations, which can be used to trigger immediate alarm notifications if critical uh, water level conditions arrive. Uh, the Hobo Micro RX station also uh, supports a wide range of our plug and play sensors uh, for flexible environmental monitoring. And again, that could be um, one of our rain gauges or, you know, tep and RH sensors, soil moisture sensors, things like that to really give you a good idea of uh, what the conditions are in these areas. So the results from this was uh, since installing these micro RX stations at each of the site's dams locations, the department along with the dam owners is now monitoring uh, this information remotely via Hobolink. They now rely on the remote alarms uh, to notify them instead of sending staff out so they can take quick and pointed response actions if needed, i.e. the water levels getting too high, you know, they can send out the alarm that people may need to prepare for flooding or something like that, or even to eliminate that, be able to maybe open up the dams or uh, discharge the water somewhere else to prevent a flash flood. Um, at this point, physical op uh, observation and measurements have been virtually eliminated, saving them time and money. And now this has allowed them to divert these resources to be deployed elsewhere. So again, a win-win situation all across. Um, another application story we have, uh, which kind of goes more into our water quality data loggers, is um, I'm not sure if anyone has heard of the Billion Oyster, pro uh, Billion Oyster Project, but they are using our conductivity pH and DO loggers um, to help uh, restore uh, the oyster population in New York. And um, essentially, um, the issue that they're having there is due to years of over-harvesting uh, over and pollution uh, within the New York harbors, um, it essentially left the oyster population uh, depleted there. Um, and a fun fact about oysters is they can actually filter up to 50 gallons of water per day. So that certainly can help clean out some pollution that is uh, within the uh, body of water there. Um, so in 2014, uh, the Billion Oyster Project was launched and with the helps of uh, volunteers, partners and students, uh, the team leading the Billion Oyster Project is dedicated to restoring oyster reefs all around the New York Harbor. Um, and uh, also, in, uh, in addition to having uh, the capability of oysters filtering water, uh, oyster reefs play an important role in providing a habitat for many species and can help prevent uh, storm damage. Again, this could be, um, you know, bio growth in the ground to keep it where you have storm surges from, you know, beach erosion, things like that. So they certainly big, play a big part in the uh, ecological system. So to help achieve their goal of rebuilding the New York uh, Harbor to a plentiful self-sustaining self estuary, the Billion Oyster Project team uses uh, Hobo data loggers to monitor water quality at their restoration sites. Salinity is a very important measurement as levels can vary greatly from site to site. And this is coming from uh, one of the researchers here. As we install reefs, it is imperative that we test various restoration methods. 
continuously evaluate our Im impact and adapt in response to our discoveries. This creates scalable best practice for oyster, uh, oyster reef restoration in challenging environments. So by using Hobo data loggers to map water quality at each location, uh, this can provide insight into the growth, growth and health of these oysters. The environmental challenge of restoring oyster reefs provides researchers and students with an opportunity to not only use science um, to explore the ecosystem, uh, but they can do this right in their backyard. As of today, the Billion Oyster Project, Project team monitors 15 active oyster reefs over five boroughs in New York Harbor and has successfully restored 47 million oysters there. So kudos to them. They're doing great work uh, with our data loggers and we are certainly excited uh, to be uh, part of uh, their success story here. So with that, uh, we've actually come to the end of the presentation. And what I would like to do is I see people have been uh, submitting quite a few questions uh, while we have been talking. Um, but I would like to open this up to the last five minutes just to go over any questions uh, that you may have. Okay, let me pop this out. So, okay. Okay, so I see one question here that we have is, what are the main differences between Hobo Optic uh, USB station and the waterproof shuttle? Are you able to redeploy the U20 logger with either device? Yes. So. On paper, uh, the base station and the waterproof shuttle look identical. The big difference between the two is that the waterproof shuttle has built-in memory on it. So essentially, you can think of it as an external hard drive. Uh, this proves beneficial if you are doing long-term deployments, but you need to periodically offload the data, and you don't necessarily want to bring the loggers back to the lab or uh, bring a laptop out to the site. Uh, to offload the data. So essentially, you connect the logger to the waterproof shuttle, offload the data to that shuttle on that built-in internal memory. The waterproof shuttle will then restart that logger for you with its last configuration, and then that allows you to redeploy that logger. The base station, you do have to put um, the base station in line between a laptop and the logger to offload the data, and then you would have to restart that data logger through uh, HoboWare Pro. Another nice feature with the Broadproof Shuttle is you can actually offload up to 63 data loggers that are full of memory uh, to one shuttle before the memory fills up on that. And then essentially you just bring the shuttle back to your office or lab, offload the data from there. All the files on there are, are independent from each other. And the file will either be the serial number of the logger, or if you gave the data logger a name when you launched it, the header of that data file will be the logger's name. Can you connect to Bluetooth uh, while the logger is underwater? Uh, short answer, no. Um, if it is in very, very, very shallow water, I'm talking about maybe a couple inches, you might be able to connect to it. Unfortunately, Bluetooth is uh, a very low energy signal. So any type of obstructions uh, really attenuate that signal. Um, so you mo more likely than not, you would have to pull it up. Now, with that being said, if you're doing some deep water applications, I have heard of divers um, putting their mobile devices into uh, a waterproof enclosure and getting it right up against our Bluetooth data logger and have been able to offload it. Um, I wouldn't commit to saying that that is a, uh, a successful way of doing it, but I have heard in the past that divers have had success uh, with that. Yep, I see we had a copy of someone uh, wanting a copy of the webinar after a uh, copy of this webinar after this. We will certainly uh, send this out. Okay, let's see here. If I use a homemade 
protective housing for my loggers? Does the color of the PVC matter for temperature? We typically recommend using white because white is going to disperse uh, the sunlight as opposed to absorb it. Now, if this is deep under the water, the light's not going to have um, an adverse effect if you did paint it black. But if it's close to the surface, um, it can it can skew the data because you know the sunlight could potentially warm it up. Um, so I would recommend using a, a lighter color if at all possible. Uh, if you did want to make it a little bit of, uh, more uh, less intrusive, I wouldn't really go black unless it's going to be in deep water, but you might be able to choose a darker color that isn't going to absorb so much of that heat from the sun. Oh, great. Oh, here's a good question regarding the cellular service. So uh, with our uh, service plans for our remote monitoring stations, um, it's an uh, annual service plan fee for it. Uh, and we do offer a few different tiers on those depending on which features you need. I would recommend if you are interested in our remote monitoring stations, feel free to contact our sales department and they'll be able to go over each of the tiered service plans that we have to see which one would best suit your needs. Okay, I see, do see another one about wastewater applications. If our loggers are intrinsically safe, we you just we used to sell an intrinsically safe data logger, but um, ours aren't rated as intrinsically safe devices. That being said, I do know many wastewater plants that are using our data loggers. Um, this is usually after the water has been processed. If you are looking to do any type of water quality monitoring pre. Uh, process water uh, reach out to our sales team uh, you can have a discussion with them and they'll be able to ascertain if um, our loggers would be a good uh, solution for your application or not all right tips on deploying uh, loggers when the water level frequently drops below uh, four centimeters so if you're referring to water level um, the sensor on our water level data loggers is right at the end. It's about uh, less than an inch up um, up where the conical part is of that water level data logger. So as long as that's underwater, um, it will still give you uh, data. Um, for our other data loggers, such as um, our pH data loggers and conductivity data loggers, uh, more so with our pH data loggers, you don't want those uh, coming out of the water. So if it's like an ephemeral stream or something, if that electro dries out, it is going to damage it and ruin it. So you would need to replace it. So um, aside from our water level data loggers, you kind of do want to make sure that the other water quality loggers that we have, um, they do stay uh, submerged in the water. Okay, I see someone asking you about what is the shuttle product number. Uh, the base station is our base U 4, and the waterproof shuttle is U DTW 1. Uh, I see someone check, uh, asking you about uh, bacteria growth. Um, we don't have any data loggers that would detect for uh, bacteria. I do know that a lot of researchers uh, monitor um, conductivity, salinity, and DO as a way to uh, ascertain if there's going to be a large algae bloom or not. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, but uh, we don't have a sensor that records or detects for bacteria. With any of our water quality data loggers, if you are deploying in an area where you do get quite a bit of bio growth, we do recommend traveling out to the site. You know, at, usually when you first deploy it, maybe you know once or twice that first week, and if you don't have much 
bio growth, you can stretch that out to a couple weeks just to give you a good idea of how, um, how much growth is getting on there. A lot of our uh, loggers do have some type of protective guards on it. Um, to help with biofouling, uh, but checking on the loggers will kind of give you a good idea of how frequently you need to go out there and clean off any type of growth on our data loggers. We, I see someone ask about phosphates and nitrates. That is a common request that we get. We don't have a sensor for that yet, uh, but it is something that our engineers are looking into. So hopefully that is something we can add to our collections. All right, this one is going out to Johnny Rowe. While this is a specific question, I think uh, it can apply to the group here. And this is going back to alarm notifications. Um, so with the alarm notifications, you can have those sent out to multiple people. And it's just a matter of inputting the uh, cell phone numbers and the email addresses that you want those alarms sent to. So even if uh, you, Johnny, if you are monitoring the station, but he has like a read-only access to it, you can still set them up for uh, receiving those alarm notifications. Oh, I see a good question here. Yes, about calibrating the pH and DO loggers. Um, so with the, the pH loggers, uh, you do a pre and post calibration on them and that will actually offset any uh, drift during the deployment. Uh, but at the very least, uh, after every deployment, we recommend that you do uh, recalibrate those loggers just to essentially uh, give it a fresh calibration for its next deployment. Because obviously water, um, the water quality may be different on its new deployment versus where it was uh, previously deployed. I, uh, another, great, uh, another great question on um, how to protect them from animals. Uh, and this goes back to uh, whatever you can do to protect it. So I have seen people where they're, maybe they're in a remote uh, location with like our RX water level station and you do have that cable that comes from the station down to the sensor. One easy way to protect that is uh, split conduit. Um, you could also get some thin PVC piping um, to slide the cable through that and then attach the sensor on the other end uh, just to uh, help um, avoid animals or critters, you know, chewing on your cable. Obviously, when you introduce an outside element to uh, a creature's natural habitat, they are going to be curious and they are going to chew on it. So any way you can uh, uh, protect the sensors or cables, um, we always recommend doing that. Oh, okay. I see Johnny you got a follow up question. Yes. If, uh, if your client has full access to, uh, the hobo link account, he can go in and set alarm notifications. Um, and then another follow up to alarm notifications is that the alarms are independent sensor to sensor. So if you set up an alarm on, you know, say one water level, um, one of our wireless water level sensors, uh, that doesn't go across all the wireless water level sensors that are connected to the station. Uh, each sensor has its own independent alarm that you can set up for it. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, how many people can connect their computers to the same, to observe a single piece of equipment? Uh, with our Bluetooth data loggers and our remote monitoring stations, uh, multiple. I don't think we have a limit. Um, I think anyone essentially can connect to those devices. Now, only uh, with our Bluetooth data loggers, only one person can offload data at a time, but uh, multiple people can connect to both our Bluetooth data loggers and our remote monitoring stations uh, to view the data. Oh, here's a great question. What's the longest deployment your data loggers can accommodate? Uh, that really comes down to uh, battery life. A lot of our data loggers, you know, they can run five years or the battery life is five years before you need to replace uh, them. So as long as you're able to set a logging interval, 
that make sure that the uh, memory doesn't fill up within that uh, before that five years, you essentially could go five years on logging data there. So we are coming to the end of the presentation here. What I'd like to do is just Hey everyone, uh, this is Lauren with Onset. It looks like we may have lost um, Shannon, but it looks like he was going to be wrapping up with our contact info. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. And as he mentioned, um, this recording will be sent out by email in a couple of days. All right, thank you everyone and have a great week.